Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I want to, to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered, gathered here on the traditional territory of Treaty 6. And I recognize the Métis people who share such a deep and c connection with this land. My name is Bill Taneda, and I'm the Alberta NDP candidate for Strathcona Sherwood Park. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by my good friend Tanine Rudick, our newly nominated NDP candidate for Fort Saskatchewan Vegreville, by Kyle Kozowski, the NDP candidate for Sherwood Park, and Lauren Dack, the MLA for Edmonton McClung, and of course, uh, Alberta's NDP transportation critic, and finally, our amazing leader, Rachel Notley. The industrial heartland is critical to our province's economic success. It is Canada's largest hydrocarbon processing region and provides employment for thousands of hardworking Albertans. And the communities surrounding the industrial heartland, like Sherwood Park, and Fort Saskatchewan are growing as they become increasingly attractive for families uh, and small businesses. As our towns and cities continue to grow, we must ensure the necessary infrastructure is there to support these communities that Albertans call home. This is about building a better future for all of us, really. And that's why I'm excited to be here today for an important announcement from Rachel but just before that, I'd like to invite Tanine to say a few words. Tanine? Thank you so much, Bill. I'm so happy to be here today to share in this important announcement. We know people living in smaller heartland communities spend their time commuting to larger centers for many reasons. And we know many industries also use the surrounding roads and highways to transport goods and services. I'm so proud to be a candidate for a party that is fully committed to investing in the future of this region and prioritizing growth and development in our industrial heartland. We know that infrastructure needs have been ignored for far too long out here, and that includes vital roadways. I look forward to supporting industry, supporting heartland res residents, and ensuring that we are doing what's necessary to keep our communities vibrant and filled with good paying jobs for generations to come. Now clearly, Bill and I are here to build anticipation for this announcement. So without further delay, I would like to turn it over to our leader, Rachel Notley. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, Lauren and to Kyle and, and to Bill and to Tanine uh, for being with us to here today and especially to uh, Tanine who is our newest candidate, uh, formerly uh, head of the FCM and we're so honored to have you as part of the team now. In the fall, I had the opportunity to meet with the Strathcona County councillors at the uh, Rural Municipalities of Alberta Convention. And one of the things that we talked about then at length was the intersection at Highway 15 and Highway 830. These roads service the local communities Bill and Tanine referenced, but they are also critical pathways for the industrial heartland. This particular intersection has been a source of frustration for area residents as well as commercial carriers and the thousands of travelers who use Highway 15 to get to other destinations in our province. This intersection is plagued by delays because rail tracks with long trains servicing the industrial heartland intersect with the roads. And these delays can cause extreme inconvenience for everyone who uses this intersection. Now, County Mayor Rod Frank told me that solving the issue is the number one infrastructure priority for Strathcona County. So, I am happy to be here today with my colleagues to announce that should we have the privilege of forming the next government, the Alberta NDP will fund a functional planning study for the creation of an interchange at Highway 15 and Highway 830 within the first 100 days of taking office. We want to make sure we make efficient use of taxpayers' dollars, but all indications are that the functional, functional planning study will recommend a diamond interchange causing, costing somewhere between $200 to $250 million. This is critical enabling infrastructure that will help attract private sector capital investment to the industrial heartland. Building this vital interchange will not only make that intersection safer and improve flow for folks traveling in this area, but it will also create jobs. 
Now, putting aside for the moment the significant incremental investment in the heartland this project will generate, we expect that the project itself will create roughly 200 direct construction jobs and another 120 indirect jobs in local surrounding communities. But as I said, we expect many more jobs to be created in the region. In December, we released a plank of our economic strategy to attract investment to Alberta by building a more resilient economy and creating good paying jobs for Albertans. And part of that strategy included a component that we referred to as supercharging the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program, otherwise known as APIP. Our plan to expand APIP, the highly successful petrochemical diversification program that our government launched back in 2016, uh, is, is, uh, is a good one. And I'm proud to say that the program is working well, but I also believe that it could work even better. So, as I said, our plan is to supercharge that program. With an infusion of $70 million annually, we will expand the eligible feedstocks of the program to include, for example, recycled plastics. And we'll expand the program to include end products. And we will bring back partial upgrading into the program, which was actually removed by the current government. By supercharging AP, or APIP, a 30% expansion, we expect to attract an additional $10 billion of new investment and create 27,000 jobs. Investing in important enabling infrastructure like the interchange that we're announcing today and continuing to support growth and development in the, our industrial heartland will go towards maximizing Alberta's competitiveness, attract investment to our province, build a resilient economy and create good paying jobs now and for future generations. Now, before I take your questions on this, I do want to respond to Danielle Smith's comments yesterday about her interference in criminal prosecutions. It is profoundly hypocritical and honestly quite ludicrous for the Premier of this province to say that she cannot speak to the public on a matter because it could potentially someday be before the courts several weeks from now when we know that the phone call at issue with Arthur Polowski at the center of this whole disturbing matter was actually about a different issue already before the courts. And she was clearly unfazed at the prospect of engaging in that matter on behalf of someone she sympathized with. These legal threats are simply a way to run the clock out and avoid letting Albertans know the truth before they cast their votes. If Danielle Smith really wants to take these matters in front of a judge, let's do it today. Either she or Attorney General Tyler Shandro can commence an independent investigation immediately and will have the truth in 30 days. Waving, waving around these threats for three weeks and then filing a civil case that won't be resolved for months if not years is just a blatant attempt to hide from accountability and hide from transparency by a Premier who is deeply fearful of both. If she actually believed the truth was her friend, she would have commissioned a judicial investigation in January. Despite the video evidence of Danielle Smith stating that she spoke to Crown prosecutors repeatedly, she now tries to claim that that didn't happen, and instead that she only spoke to the Deputy Attorney General. For the record, the Deputy Attorney General is also a Crown prosecutor, and the Premier pressuring him is also a clear breach of the independence of our judicial system. Bottom line is she's attempting to confuse the issue, but the facts are very clear. Arthur Pulowski participated in the Klutz blockade, a blockade that cost Albertans $800 million in economic loss. One person in that blockade has been convicted of assault with a weapon as a result of speeding their truck towards a police officer. Four more people are awaiting trial for charges of conspiracy to murder police officers. And Pulowski is charged with encouraging violence against police officers. These are the people Danielle Smith is standing up for. Our justice critic, Irfan Sabir, has also written to the Ethics Commissioner. Based on the recording of Smith's phone call with Pulowski, we believe Smith also violated the Conflict of Interest Act by inappropriately using the powers of her office on his behalf. 
What we know for sure is that Danielle Smith spends her time in the Premier's office pandering to extremists and not focusing on the matters that are important to families here in Sherwood Park or across Alberta. So thank you, and uh, any of us here are happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Just a reminder that if you're on Zoom, it's the raise hand function. If you're on the phone, it's star nine to get in the question queue. Please state your name at outlet and who, who you would like to direct your question to. Caller, you're unmuted. Uh, hi, Rachel. It's Steve from CP. Um, I want to ask you about um, uh, what we don't know. I mean, we know what the Premier said, but what we don't know is what she did with that information afterward. We don't know if she shared with the Crown Prosecutor that she had spoken with the accused in the trial. We don't know actually if she, if she informed anybody in the Justice Department that this call had taken place. She said she was going to make some, some inquiries on his behalf, but we don't know if the, if the Premier is speaking with the accused in a case before the courts and the justice system is not, has no knowledge that this is taking place, do we need to know that? Does that matter? Um, it sure does, Dean. Uh, but let me back up a little bit. What we do know from her own words and her own voice on audio, on video, is that she uh, had previously spoken to the Deputy Attorney General, not on frequent occasions, um, um, about, and potentially to other Crown Prosecutors, because quite frankly, now she says she never spoke to other Crown Prosecutors, but we have her on video, or on audio, several times saying she did. So I'd say, at best, that's a 50-50 question. But even if you take her at her current words, this day, changes every day, but even if you take her at her current words, she spoke to the Deputy Attorney General regularly about whether this was in the public interest and whether there was a reasonable likelihood of, of prosecution or of conviction. That in and of itself, over and over and over and over, on the face of it, is pressure, is an attempt to influence. In addition, according to the video, and she hasn't contradicted this either, she also had already spoken to the Deputy Attorney General about the specific conduct and the strategies of a particular case because basically the prosecutor was trying too hard. Um, and, and so we know that happened by her own admission, and even that she hasn't walked away from yet. So, but you're quite right, going forward, we also need to know what happened after this conversation. And um, that is why, and we also frankly need to know what happened with respect to other cases that are impacted uh, by this. You know, she talks about how other cases were dropped. Well, how many phone calls were made uh, before those, uh, those other cases were dropped? We don't know. And so that is why we must have an independent uh, judicial investigation of this whole matter. And that is why the longer the Premier ducks, dives, dodges, and hides from accountability, um, the, the more damage she does and the less leadership she shows. Do you have a follow-up, Dean? Yeah, thanks, Don. I have a third one, too, if you can get me in at some point or after. But uh, I want to follow that because if we don't know, if the Premier is not telling the justice officials that, we, that, that she's even having these conversations with the accused, have we not set up a parallel clandestine back channel working outside the justice system whereby the premier is, is uh, advising, commiserating, sharing information on trials, i.e. document dumps, with select accused outside of the justice system? Is that not what's being created here? And if so, what does that mean? Well, I think, uh, listen, th there are so many ways uh, in which what she did was wrong. And there are so many ways in which uh, the, the conduct of the Premier uh, um, undermines and interferes with and changes the course of uh, the um, prosecution of these cases. Now, you describe one uh, potential way, um, uh, Dean, there's, there's other potential ways too. There's, um, the problem is, is that the minute you've got someone with as much influence and authority as the Premier, 
uh, engaging with any party to individual cases, there is the potential for it to go offside and for the independence of our judicial system to be undermined uh, and breached. Um, and so we don't know. And again, um, we need to have a judicial investigation in order to get the answers to these questions. What we know on video, on audio, is that she was repeatedly putting pressure, the pressure of her office, the pressure of her role, onto people who are supposed to be kept completely away from political interference when it comes to making decisions around the prosecution. We know that. She's admitted to it. And so uh, there are so many ways in which this could have compromised the case. And, um, and, and that's why there must be a judicial investigation. Thanks, Dean. We're just going to hop over to Sarah. Sarah, your line is open. Hello, Ms. Hey, I'm hoping that um, you can give us some information about this intersection with the trains. I know in Edmonton for the 50th Street crossing, we were given information about how regularly trains are blocking the intersection, how much time that intersection um, is, is unaccessible for cars. Do we have any of those hard statistics? I'm just going to pass you over to uh, Bill Tanita. Sarah, thanks for the question. Uh, but we know that this is a very busy intersection. There are uh, 10 or 12 train set, sets of train tracks that go right parallel to the highway at that intersection. About 36 trains a day pass through there. And if you think about the backup that causes as thousands of workers are trying to get in and out of the heartland every day at shift change, imagine what you might see. We often see times where there could be uh, cars a, a kilometer long along the highway stretching, waiting to get into the heartland. Um, that's how serious this intersection problem is. Thank you, sir. Do you have a follow-up? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll do one more pass for questions. Reminder, if you're on Zoom, it's the raised hand function. If you're on the phone, it's star nine. Dean, your line is open. Welcome back. Thanks. I'm just unmuting myself there. So we've learned today the uh, Premier announced that the uh, the party is funding this lawsuit or this potential lawsuit or this legal action against CBC. What does that mean? So now we've got a situation where if you look at the letter, he's clearly acting on, we are counsel to Premier of Alberta. He is acting in uh, for her in her role as Premier but the lawsuit's being funded by the party. Does that matter? Does that, like, if you're funding this lawsuit, does that mean she is she is acting as, uh, she's taking action as premier, but if uh, it all goes the way they want it to and they sue for defamation, they get damages, who gets the damages? Does the party get the damages? Does, if you're funding the lawsuit, do you get to say and how it's conducted? What does, what is this, uh, suing on behalf of one side and, and the other side is funding it, really. She's wearing two different hats, isn't she? Well, I mean, certainly one thing, I guess I would say three things about it. First of all, what we know is that um, when uh, legal issues arise uh, in relation to um, a member of executive council doing their job, there is in fact uh, a fund to ensure that the uh, government of Alberta um, uh, covers the costs of those legal disputes. What this suggests to me is that it's very possible that the people who run that fund uh, within the government of Alberta and within, within the, um, the Ministry of Attorney General don't actually think that this is a particularly valid um, uh, legal uh, um, uh, strategy for the Premier. And it's not a problem that she ran into by virtue of uh, doing her appropriate job as the premier, uh, rather she ran offside, like I don't, in a way that is unprecedented and 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 unacceptable. And so the only way that this lawsuit can even be pr uh, pursued is if she goes to uh, UCP donors and asks them to pay for um, her. Um, her, her lawsuit and you know and I'm not sure how many UCP donors actually would think that that was the appropriate use of their their uh, money but anyway that's a different issue the second point is of course is that it speaks to uh, what this really is this is a political tactic 
This is a, a damage control issues management strategy that uh, she has adopted to try and use as a shield from having to show the leadership that would otherwise be required to take responsibility and show accountability for her conduct in her role. And so the UCP is playing a, a, a pretty uh, gross political games uh, by creating a pr almost fake uh, legal um, uh, issue here um, in order to uh, keep their boss uh, protected from having to openly and honestly answer questions uh, to the people of Alberta about her missteps. So. Um, uh, you know, I think that that's really the issue. And then the third thing that I would say is, uh, again, is if uh, she wants uh, the courts to uh, look fully at whether she was the victim of defamation, the best way to do that is to appoint an independent justice to start working right now. And then not only, you know, if she has nothing to hide, well, her name could be cleared. And not only that, the people of Alberta would have some reassurance uh, that our just justice system uh, is not being uh, inappropriately interfered with by um, uh, random UCP premiers. But um, listen, that's not what she's really going for. So as a result, at this point, what we see is someone playing a uh, um, petty political game um, by creating a, you know, rather uh, uh, weak uh, defamation claim. Thank you. We'll just do one more pass for questions. So I have uh, one more comment, then I'll just offer uh, just one comment about uh, the announcement made uh, by um, the uh, UCP around uh, police. Let me say, first of all, that, of course, uh, we feel for so many folks in, in our communities, both in Edmonton, Calgary, and otherwise, who are worried about increasing crime and increasing feelings of uh, insecurity um, in, in, in their communities. But let's be clear about what's really going on here. Soon after getting elected, the UCB took funding away from cities, particularly uh, Calgary and Edmonton, that was otherwise used to pay for their policing in the form of fine revenue. The amount that they're putting back today is roughly the same amount that they have taken away a few years ago. So in addition to that, we know that crime uh, in, our, in our downtown cores in particular has grown as a result of greater instability and, and community fragility arising from what? Well, the fact that this UCP government uh, stopped uh, our, uh, our funding affordable housing the way uh, we had uh, originally planned. They cut affordable housing, they cut rent supplements, they pushed people onto the street, um, and they um, uh, started playing around with eligibility for income support. They've created more crisis in many communities. We know that in Edmonton, for instance, the number of people living uh, homeless has almost almost doubled in the last four years. So if you, so they're putting money back in that they took out for police. They're not making up for uh, the incredible suffering they created um, by cutting housing uh, funding and, and rent supplements. Uh, so there's more to do, and frankly, this is their issue. Thank you, I see we have one more question from Dean. Go ahead, Dean. Okay, thanks, Donna. So, Premier, I need you to elaborate on that first point you made, because uh, I assume you're, draw you're drawing on your experience as Premier. So you're saying that there is an account for Executive Council that is used to fight uh, court actions on their behalf. However, you don't just get to tell them, pay it. You have to make a case to them, and then they have to approve it. What um, Can you please elaborate on what this is about? That's a really good uh, question, and I cannot remember the specific details about it, but essentially there's a fund, uh, I'm not sure if it's an insurance fund or, or a straight fund, uh, that covers uh, legal uh, costs of members of executive council, primarily, it may be extended to other MLAs, but it's mostly designed for uh, members of executive council, uh, should they get uh, named in lawsuits um, uh, as a result of them doing their job um, it, 
you know, uh, as members of executive council. And, and so that fund is there. Um, it's been used uh, before by, by members of all parties. Uh, and what I'm saying here is if she believed that uh, she was truly the victim of defamation as a result of doing her job as premier, that is a fund they could have gone to. But uh, when that happens, you know, you're not hiring the lawyers, the public service is hiring the lawyers, and the lawyers are giving the advice uh, that the law would suggest they give. But because I would argue the Premier is so offside with the law, she is instead uh, going to a partisan source of funding so that she can use this legal action as a political tactic, not as a genuine uh, legal um, uh, claim. I don't have as much control over the the how it's conducted how this lawsuit is conducted there's actually that would that is certainly my experience that that yes you you don't have as much agency over how it's conducted um, you definitely would have much more agency if the party was paying it um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's basically it. And we can certainly circle back around with you, Dean, uh, with more details on it because it's it's been a while since I've uh, been familiar with it. But um, uh, happy to do that. Okay, thank you, everyone. That concludes our press conference for today. Thank you.